Welcome to Bible Study, at sponsored by, hosted by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. I am uh, Josh Laborious, Vicar Josh Laborious. I've been leading this study um, both in person before coronavirus and then um, here via video afterward. And this video is on Revelation 6. That's the chapter we're going to be covering as we continue to walk through the book of Revelation one chapter at a time. And we're going to pretty much step right into it. A, a little bit of introduction on Revelation 6 before we get into the text itself. Revelation 6 begins the, the prophetic part of Revelation. In the first several chapters, you see things that are more, I don't want to say applicable, but they're more literal. There are things that are much easier for us to understand. There are things that much more directly connect to our lives and to the lives of, of people on earth. But as we step into Revelation 6, we start to see more prophecy, more things pointing toward the end times. And it, it gets harder to understand. It, it really does. Um, I want to be really upfront about that. And there are a lot less clear-cut, clean answers when it comes to Revelation 6. So, what we see here is we see three cons the, the first of three concentric visions taking place on earth. And this is where um, Revelation gets weird. To us, if you're watching the video and, and you're from a Western background, it, it gets a little bit weird to us because traditionally, usually, if you read Western literature, if you read our books, if you read papers, if you the way that we're taught to write, it's very linear. If events happened in the order A, B, C, D, we write them in the order A, B, C, D. We tell stories that way. We, we start at the beginning, we go to the middle, we go to the end. Revelation doesn't work like that. What we see is the first of kind of a story that happens here, and then we're, we're to, or a sequence of events, however you want to describe it, that sequence of events. And then after that, we're going to see another sequence of events that happens at the same time, but it's a different view of it. It's a different way of explaining it. And then we're going to see another circle of events happens at the same time as the first two. So all of these events are happening kind of simultaneously, but it's different ways of looking at the same event. If if this were a sermon structure, what we'd, we'd define it as is something called a multiple perspectives structure, where you look at an issue or a topic or something one way, and then you go back and look at it another way, and then you go back and look at it another way. But it's the same structure all three times. So all of that to say, as we walk through this, we're going to be kind of arcing back on ourselves over and over again in Revelation, and then John takes kind of asides, uh, little breaks in his writing later to describe, so here are all the events that I was just talking about, pretend they're in like a ball here. John is then going to describe kind of an overarching st cosmic storyline that starts before the Bible is written and ends well after we're all dead and gone. So um, that's what we're stepping into the midst of. So bear with me, we'll walk along through it, we'll go a chapter at a time, we'll take it one piece at a time, and we'll get through it. So, each of these three visions that I'm talking about has seven scenes. In, in the first vision, it's seven seals. In the second vision, it's seven trumpets. And in the third vision, it's seven censers. Censer as in uh, a thing you would put incense in and swing around and it burns the incense. Um, anyway, so... As we walk through, we're going to get to maybe why we're going to rehash that number seven again. What I want to be perfectly clear on, and this is something that gets misinterpreted all over the place. If you, you're you here on YouTube watching this video, I guarantee if you search for Revelation, you're going to get more videos than not that explain Revelation as looking for specific events in human history. That is not what Revelation is written for. That is not how it is written. That's not how the language is developed. We're, we're not looking for these specific things to happen. It's, it's not like some checklist for the end times. These portray conditions, circumstances, and contexts 
that are in reality, they have been true since the moment Jesus was on this earth. They continue to be true today, and they will continue to be true until the end. Because as soon as Jesus came the first time, we entered the end times. We entered kind of this approach to Jesus' second coming. So as we go through, all of these have been true consistently throughout history. We're not looking for a, a specific historical event to match up to this. And we're going to talk about that more as we go. But be very cautious if you run into anyone who is teaching that this uh, reflects a specific point or a specific event or person or, or what have you in history. Because that's not what Revelation is written to do. That's not what Rev Revelation is trying to communicate. So, that's kind of a, a disclaimer I want to put on this whole thing. And I'm going to rehash that throughout because I want to be perfectly clear on what we're talking about and what we can take away from this. And also what we shouldn't take away from this. So, as we go forward, the, the three sevens has, has a couple possible reasons Um there's some like numerological things. There, there is just the reality that it's a, it's a literary structure and design, and it could be as simple as that. You have three sevens. It's a nice structure. The other thing is that this this sequence of numbers, these numbers are holy numbers of God in Jewish tradition, and the the other kind of reality is this is three opportunities to hear and apply the same message. It could be as simple as that he he wants to make sure that people can access this message can understand this message and so he's presenting it multiple different ways and for those of you who don't know i have a background in education this is an incredibly effective educational principle in fact a lot of teaching can be kind of boiled down to being able to explain information in a in a plethora of different ways because if you're teaching a classroom of 10 kids, three of them might understand it the way you understand it. Two of them might need it explained a slightly different way to understand it. And the, the last five might need it explained in a radically different way. And you're explaining the same concept every time. But to connect with each group of kids, you need to explain it a different way, whether it's visually or audially or, or they're kinesthetic learners and they kind of need to experience what you're teaching. Um, so you have you have all of that going. That that's just a possibility. This could be written this way just so that, multi, like there are different ways to access the information. So that is all the background I want to give you. I want to kind of throw at you as we step into the text, as we actually get into these prophetic visions. So at this point in in the study, I would encourage you go ahead and get out your handy dandy Bibles, um, whatever they look like, whatever they are. Um, or if you don't have a physical Bible, I have no problem with you pulling out your phone, pull out your phone. Uh, you're, you're watching on a computer or something, pull it up on that, whatever it is. Um, again, for those of you who haven't been in my studies before the app that I, uh, advocate for, I guess, and I'm not sponsored by them, um, is it's simply called Bible. I think it's marketed as the U version app. It's, it's right here. Um, on the edge of my phone screen. It's very simple. It's very easy to navigate if you open it up. Um, it's very easy to get to the text, to get to whatever text you need to get to. Mine is currently open to Psalm. Um, but I digress. So get your Bible out, whatever that looks like, and turn to Revelation 6. It is toward the end of your Bible. So, as we step into Revelation 6, I want us to start with the first seven verses, and it says, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering, and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. 
and its rider had a pair of scales in his hands, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. So, we're going to kind of pause there for a second. And we have these seven seals. Now, if you recall, if you go back to the video on Revelation 5, these seven seals are on the scroll that contains God's plan for salvation. And the one opening these seals is Jesus Christ. Now, we covered it in five. I'll cover it again because it's a really quick concept. The reason that there are seven seals is, first of all, seven is a number of divine completeness. That is kind of the symbolism that is attached to it throughout the scripture. This also kind of just gives us confidence in the security of the contents of the scroll. Our, the plan, God's plan for our salvation is incredibly secure. And there's also this reality that Roman civil law, so the culture that this would have been originally written in, the Roman culture, the civil law sealed a last will and testament with seven seals. So what we read into that is that the, this God's plan for salvation is, is his final will. He's not going to go change his mind about this. Um, so we have all of that. And then there's this invitation to John for him to come, to look, to be a me, uh, the, the mediator of an angel reaches out to him. And John is watching all of these things. And then we step into the four horsemen. The, the, this is kind of like a... I don't know, a popular part of the imagery of Revelation has been used in different popular contexts. If you Google um, the four horsemen of the Revelation, what, what's actually kind of cool is as you Google them, um, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and you go to the Google images about them, they're actually pretty accurate to how the Bible describes them, which I think just kind of points to kind of how naturally dramatic this passage is. Like, you don't have to really get creative with it. Like, I, I'm, I've pulled up that web page in front of me right now, um, and most of them, they're fairly accurate. I mean, they're, they're artist portrayals, but it's, it's some cool imagery that we have going on here. Um, so I do, I would encourage you, if, if you are um, interested in that, go ahead and pause this video and uh, pull out your grab your phone on the computer that you're on, whatever, just open another tab. And I would say, go ahead and just search for Horsemen of the Apocalypse and you can kind of see some of the images. And I'd encourage you to see where do these images kind of match up with the biblical description? Um, where do they differ and where do they maybe just take some artistic license? Um, anyway, so we have all of that. And I want to get into the symbolism of each of these horsemen. And what I want to I, I believe I've said this before. I hope I've said this before. And what I'm going to say again now, what I'm going to continue to say as we get into this more potentially symbolic language is that I am not committing to Revelation as being either purely symbolic or purely literal. Because I think neither of those interpretations of the book of Revelation is being fair to the book of Revelation. In the case of the horsemen, at the end of time, if God wants to send out literal horsemen to do these things on the earth, I am not going to deny that he has the capability and the freedom to do so. At the same time, though, this language really lends itself to being metaphorical, to, to being symbolic of things that are going on in the world. So when I look at the four horsemen, I'm not willing to say that there aren't going to be four literal horsemen but I think it, it would be a shame of us, uh, it would be remiss of us, it would be irresponsible of us to not seriously look at the symbolism that each one carries. So the people that say it's always symbolic, I, I, I would say to them, God can kind of do whatever he wants. But the guys, the people who would say it's only literal, I say you're, you're missing a lot of the, the wealth that is in this scripture. So... That is my, I guess, little soapbox on that, on the symbolism and or literal nature of the book of Revelation. So with that, let's step into these horsemen. First, we have the white horse. 
that appears in verse 2. I looked, behold, a white horse, its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering. Uh, the purpose of this white horseman is as conqueror. That is what he is sent out to do. Um, and we see this, this bow, the rider had a bow, and you say, well, why did it have a bow? Referring to like a bow and arrow. Uh, bow, historically, is a symbol of intention to conquer by military might. And what's really interesting, if you kind of get into this symbolism here, um, I'm kind of a, I, I don't want to say I'm a nerd. I'm not a big history guy. But there's a game that my brother and I really like to play on the computer. It's called Rome Total War, where you kind of step into the place, you take leadership of uh, a nation during the rise of the Roman Empire, and then from there you try to conquer the world. You manage your cities, you lead armies, etc., 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 um, so this and this nation is featured in that game, which has some degree of historical accuracy. Uh, obviously, they take liberties because it's a game. But um, the Parthians were a an incredibly militaristic culture of the time. And what's really interesting here is is the symbolism of the white horse. Part in the Parthian military, their leaders war rode white horses. That's how they, they were distinguished. If you saw a, a rider of a white horse in the Parthian military, they were a leader in some degree. They were also really the only ancient mounted archers, which makes them significant. And, and they were such a fierce militaristic society. They were so fierce in, in their desire to fight and to conquer that Rome, even Rome, arguably one of the most powerful military empires in the history of the world, never managed to completely subject them. That's how fierce they were. So when we have that imagery, that would have been something John would have been aware of. We see this white horse with the bow, and it's reminiscent of these incredibly fierce conquerors in the Parthians. And then you see this crown, which again, is not a symbol of royalty in the Roman world. Uh, not only a symbol of royalty, it's frequently a symbol of victory. So we, we have that symbolism here of a victorious conqueror, and white indicates a belief in a divine right to conquer. This is the color of God's wisdom, of his majesty, and it's reserved for those who act on God's behalf. So what, it, what we cannot do is say that these horsemen act without the permission, without the command of God, because that is what is happening here. God is sending these things out into the world. So when we see them, when we recognize them, we cannot dismiss them as not being the work of God. Even though it makes us uncomfortable to view God as sending out conquerors into the world. Because this is very explicit. He is, he is symbolizing tyranny acquired by power and force. This is triumphant militarism. This is the lust of conquest that makes great empires. And... This is something, again, we're not looking for a specific conqueror in history. It, it was the Romans, and then it was another nation, and we see it in the British Empire, and then we see it, uh, frankly, a little bit in America as we expand throughout the continent. You see this over and over again, this desire for conquest. You see it in both of the world wars, kind of as a driving force. This is something that has plagued humanity, and, and despite... All of the people who, who strive for peace, who want peace. What we're being promised here is that until Christ comes again, this is going to be a reality of the human condition. This is something that we are going to continue to suffer, this desire for power, this desire for conquest. And it, it looks a little different now than it used to. I think now it, it's a lot more diplomatic. It's a lot more through uh, a social pressure and cultural pressure and, and diplomatic such rather than solely militaristic conquest. But I think we still see this today. There is this thirst for power, this thirst for more that controls and devastates our world. And that's what we see in this white horseman. Um, and frankly, and... I'm going to try not to get on a soapbox here. We see this in our, pol in, if you are watching this in, in America, we see this in our politicians today. 
We see a lot of them, and I'm not going to say all of them because I, I realize that some of them genuinely do want to help the country, but you see so much driven in our political realm today on both sides of the aisle is driven by this desire for power, this desire for authority, this desire, frankly, for conquest. Um, and we see a promise here that it's it's not something we can put an end to. So that's the white horse. And then we step forward into verse 3 and we see uh, another horse coming out bright red. Its rider is permitted to take peace from the earth. And what's really interesting here is we see that there's an important order to the horsemen. Because the next three horsemen kind of come in the wake of the conqueror. We see the conqueror go out and then we kind of see these next three almost as the result of the conqueror's efforts. Um, so th they follow that. And he's given permission by Christ. Its rider is permitted to take peace from the earth. And I'm, I'm going to give you a plug here. And this video should be released on Monday. I'm recording it on Friday. It should be released on Monday. And on Sunday, Pastor Steve has told me that he will be preaching on the text that Jesus, where Jesus says, Jesus says, I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. So this is a consistent theme here. And if you want to, if you want to get into Jesus's words there a little bit more, I would encourage you go to St. Paul's YouTube page. Hopefully you're subscribed to it. Go to the YouTube page, go to the worship service, and you are looking for the worship service on June 28th, 2020. He's preaching at the 9 o'clock or the 1045. I would encourage you to watch his sermon where, where he's going to touch on, I came to bring not peace, but a sword. Um, so we see this, this permission given by Christ. And this horseman is symbolic of warfare and the shedding of blood by unlawful means. And, and we see, again, we, we see this in, in the military campaigns of Rome, of the British Empire. We see it in World War I, in World War II, in every war since. We see this, this desire for power that drives people to violence. And I, see, I think you see this even on a smaller scale within our society. You, you see this shedding of blood by unlawful means. You see people taking uh, justice into their own hands. You see people... Uh, committing violence because they want more power. You could say that, um, for, for example, something that I'm not particularly familiar with, so I'm going to not go too deep into this because I don't actually know what I'm talking about. But for example, in gang violence, a lot of that comes from a struggle for power, whether it be for territory or for, for money or for funding or whatever they're fighting about. It's At its core, it's a struggle for power that results in this shedding of blood that results in this violence. We see this, if you look at the videos at this time, there is an incredible awareness of, of police brutality. And there is an incredible awareness that, that some police, and I am not one to paint anyone with a broad brush. I'm not going to say cops are bad because at least all the cops I know personally are, are wonderful people who, who are sincere in their desire to build up society um, through law enforcement. However, you see these videos of, of cops who are not, and they are violent, and they're taking j justice in, in whatever form that they are seeing that, or frankly, there's a desire for control, and they are um, they're violent as a result. And that is a shame, that is a sin. We, we look at that and we say that is a sin, but what we're promised here is that that violence that we see in, in police brutality, that we see in, in gang violence, that we see in domestic abuse where, where men and, or women are committing violence against their partner for control, for power. We see that in, in all facets of our world where there is violence and there's this struggle uh, for power. And what we're being promised here is that that is going to be the rule not the exception until the second coming. Our sinful, sinful nature drives us to control, and that's what we see in, with the white horsemen, and it drives us then to violence. And we see that with the red horsemen. Now, are we called to strive to do better? Yes. But when we, when we think that 
our idols of government or uh, if we put the right laws or policies in place that we're going to somehow eradicate this violence from our society the reality is that we're not it is in our broken nature and, and our only hope is redemption through jesus christ so we have that um and I, I realize that this is being colored a little bit by current events. So if you're watching this later, it may be less applicable to you. Um, but I digress. So what we see here is we see this promise of violence. So when people ask me, well, what do you think we should do about, about gun violence or police brutality or, or rioting that has come from peaceful protests and that, that some individuals have, have taken too far? Um, or, or violence or murder or domestic abuse, all of these different issues that plague our society. And if you ask me, what are we going to do about it? I say, we're going to strive to do better ourselves. But the reality is that this is going to be the, the, the reality of our world until Christ comes again. So we have to put our faith in him to change heart and mind um, and to forgive. So that's what we have with the Red Horseman. Moving on, we have this Black Horseman uh, which you'd think, given our society, we'd say, what is the black horseman going to symbolize? And we'd say death because, you know, we, we associate the color black with death. Um, that's not the case, though. That's not the case. You see, we, we have this black horse and it has a pair of scales in its hand. And it comes, there, there's a voice that says, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and wine. Um, this is an unidentified voice. It comes throughout the book. It's in the midst of the four living creatures. So it could be God. It could be God who's in the center of the four living creatures, or it could just be an angel. It could be a high servant of God. Um, but this black horse, it represents scarcity and imbalance. When it, says, when it refers to the pair of scales in its hands and then has these measurements called out, uh, the scales are, are representative of imbalance in our world and scarcity, which it, it's incredible that this is coming up now because I think this is something that our society is really struggling with right now. Whether it's uh, different cultural groups, different, different races, um, or genders, or, you know, men versus women, black, white, um, Asian, Hispanic, all of these different disparities we see in society, even just socioeconomic disparities between rich and poor. Um, we see these disparities and we, we don't want them to be there. Um, and you see movements, you see protests, you see people elected, you see politicians grandstanding, you see all these things seeking to remove this disparity, this, this inequality, the scarcity. And again, this is a promise that that is going to be a reality of our world until Christ comes again. And we can strive in, in our lives to seek to be better. But to put a false hope in anything that promises that it's going to fix it on a global scale or even on a societal scale, that is putting our hope in the wrong thing. Because the only one who can correct that, the only one who completes this plan for salvation is Jesus Christ. Um which is what I'm going to keep coming back to because that is, the, first of all, the point of Revelation, but that is the only place we can put our hope when we see all of these things that that are kind of disheartening, that there's always going to be people seeking power over other people, that there's always going to be violence, that there's always going to be imbalance and inequality and disparity. It's disheartening. And that's why I keep pointing us back to Christ. Um, so, that's what we have in the black horse. That, that's a little more simple. Um, I, I guess I skipped the explanation of the, the quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. Um, that is speaking towards scarcity. That's, that's saying that these, these staples um, would have been extraordinarily expensive. And when it says, do not harm the oil and wine, it's saying, you know, we're kind of, we're holding on to this. We're being really careful with this because there's not a lot of it. So it's saying that, that these resources are not plentiful, that it's a struggle to get them, that it's really expensive to get them. Um, so that's an explanation of that. And then we go to the last horseman, and that is the, uh, the green horse. 
This symbolizes the death that results from the previous three. From people lusting for power, from violence, from scarcity. Um, it speaks to the, the writer's name is death and Hades follows him. Hades as the grave. And again, at any time in history, this could be true. All of these things lead to people dying. And there's a promise that death is going to continue until the end of time, um, which makes our hope in Christ extraordinarily important. Um, so that's what we have in the first eight verses of Revelation. Um, these next verses hopefully are going to go pretty quickly. I realize I'm already at a half hour. If you need to take a break and come back, I don't fault you for that at all. But we are going to step forward. We're going to finish this chapter. Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11, it says, um, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they bore. They cried out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves has been. So, I saw under the altar these saints. That's who John's talking about. This, is, this refers to the interim state, which is something we don't know a lot about. This is really almost the extent of what we know about the interim state. And that's a theological term that I'm using. And what the interim state refers to is the time after we die, but before we actually, before the second coming of Christ. And so the evidence here says, it points to the reality that we are still with Christ. We're with God. It's not quite heaven yet, but there is that rest. There is that peace that we are with God. They're waiting for the new creation and reunification with their bodies. And there are a whole lot of tangents I could go into with that, but I am not going to. If you want to hear more about the interim state, go ahead and comment under this video, and I will I will do an entire separate video on the interim state. So, and they cry out to God, and they say, How long before you judge and avenge our blood? What is key here is they did not avenge their own blood. Their Christian brothers and sisters did not avenge them. That is not our place. And this is another misinterpretation that you get a lot in Revelation. You have people seeking uh, to develop Christendom, to develop a Christian kingdom where Christians are conquering and avenging themselves and, and taking justice into their own hands. And what this is saying is that is not our place. We are not called to take power. We are not, we are not called to, to be the, um, the, the political kingdom of Christ here on earth. That is God's place to take power and authority. We are just to follow him faithfully. Um, so, I have a tangent prepared on judgment and condemnation, etc., etc., etc. But essentially what this is saying is, is it's up to God. Leave it up to God. It is not our place to condemn. Um, so, and then it says, each were given a white robe. This is symbolic of forgiveness. Jesus Christ uses this imagery again and again and again. Um, and, and then they're told to rest a little longer. What he's saying is, be patient in your peaceful rest. I will act on your behalf. That is what God is saying here. Um, and they're supposed to rest until their fellow servants and brothers should be complete. Until the sufferings and persecutions of the whole people of God is complete. This is another thing we're being promised until the second coming. Christians, you and I, are going to continue to suffer and continue to be persecuted. So if you were to take, so far in this video, if you were to take one kind of lesson out of the beginning of Revelation 6, out of these first 11 verses, the lesson that I would have you take out of it is that there is going to be a reality of suffering and persecution and of violence and of death and of scarcity and of inequality and imbalance in this world. And the reality is no matter how hard we try, and we should try to do our best to live um, not perpetuating those things, we're not going to get rid of them. It is not our place. It is not within our power to get rid of them. That is something that God alone is capable of.
so and he he will he will eliminate all of those things at his second coming so let's step forward into the last five verses here of revelation 6 we have starting at verse 12 it says he opened the sixth seal and i looked and behold there was a great earthquake the sun became black as sackcloth the full moon became like blood and the stars of the earth fell to the sky as fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale the sky vanished like a scroll being rolled up. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come and who can stand? So as we step through, we have a lot of imagery here. First, the sun becomes black. This reflects imagery found in Joel 2, in Joel 3, in Isaiah 34, and it's connected to sackcloth. This is as penitential. The whole world here is in mourning and repentance. And then the moon becomes like blood. Those same passages, Joel 2 and 3 and Isaiah 34, they reflect this imagery. And there's this reality that we are told earlier in Scripture that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And we see that in Christ's shedding of blood on the cross. But the reality is that this would be a terrifying thing to experience. The stars of the sky are falling. The entirety of creation is being shaken and disturbed because only the kingdom of heaven is unshakable. And in Joel, in the Old Testament, in the prophecies found there, Joel says all of this will happen prior to the terrible day of the Lord. And Jesus uses very similar symbolism of the fig tree that is found here in Mark 13. And then the sky vanishes. It's, it's rolled up like a scroll. Heaven and earth will pass away. And the suddenness of this shaking is being portrayed here. Everything will pass away. So there's this reality here that there is nothing worth clinging to in this world. Our, our, the various things we put our trust in, our identity, and our, there, there's materialism, but there's also other, other people, political structures, institutions, all these things we put all of our faith in. Which right now, I think one of the favorite idols in America is the political system. People put a lot of faith in their political party or in particular politicians or policies or legislations. And that's not what you should put your faith in. Because they're going to fall away just like everything else. They're going to fade and, and crumble and disappear just like anything else. Um, which we see right here, the kings of the earth, the great ones, the generals, the rich and the powerful, and everyone is running and hiding from this. No one is safe. No one is so important that they are immune to what is going on here. Um and then we see that they're hiding from the wrath of the Lamb. You see, because the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is given the right to save and to condemn. And all of that shaking, the, the foundational altering of our world is preparing for the day of the Lamb. The opening of the sixth seal signifies, this is the first clue that this is a vision of the end of the world. Because like I told you, all of the previous uh, seals... Those have been true since Jesus came, but this is, is making a transition to the end of time. Now, what I want to keep before us as, as this is kind of a despair-inducing passage is I want to keep Christ's forgiveness in mind and his words to the saints of rest and of peace, because that's what we should be keeping in front of us. Because you and I as saints, as forgiven children of God, adopted children of God, we are safe from the wrath of the Lamb. Um, we still try to stand on our own, and, and that's wrong. And it's saying here that it's not going to matter, no matter how rich or powerful or influential you become. You're no better off than the lowliest person in the world without Christ. Um, so that is Revelation 6. And I, I know that was a longer video. I appreciate you sticking with me. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. I do check. I will reply, um, even if that is, replies to say, I don't know. Because the reality is some questions I don't have answers to. And I'm at peace with that because God is greater than me and he has it figured out. So 
that's what I have for you today. Um, again, questions, comments, concerns below. If, if this video was helpful, helpful to you, go ahead and give it a like. Also below, go ahead and subscribe to the channel um, because we have other Bible studies going on. We have um, daily devotions. We have worship services. We have all kinds of great stuff going on here at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. Um, again, I hope this, this Bible study was helpful to you. I hope it made Revelation a little bit clearer, um, maybe corrected some misconceptions. And uh, with that, brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.